Okay, so I'm recording now. And um, what I'll do in today's session is uh, I want to look at, um, actually I want to look at a question that somebody asked in the last week's group sessions um, and uh, explore the idea that they asked a little bit. So the foundation of all we're doing is that we can use the Laplace transforms to create transfer functions. And we've got some basic rules of how we can use transfer functions, how we can add them together, how we can multiply them together um, to find system responses. And understanding that is really crucial to uh, everything else that you're going to do. So all of the control work uh, that you do with Professor Costas is going to be making use of these transforms uh, and picking values to make the transforms behave in certain ways. Um, so it's really important that we've got a, a good solid understanding of why we're doing that in the first place and what we can and can't do with them. So uh, I've given the um, teaching assistants uh, a few uh, questions to look at with you in the sessions afterwards. So please do stick around afterwards and join your groups. Um, they've got uh, some questions to talk to you about um, just to make sure that you understand uh, linearity and um, uh, the different types of differential equations. Okay, so the question that came up last week was about the distillation problem that we'd covered in the lectures. So I'm just going to sketch that, get myself set up. So we were talking about a system that looked like this. We have a distillation column, we've got a feed, we've got some reflux going back in. We've got our product with distillate composition XD. <clears throat> and then likewise at the bottom, we reboil part of the <clears throat> bottom product, put it back in the column, and then we've got a bottom product coming out XB. We had that problem and we were looking at it from a control point of view. Um, so from the control point of view, we were considering where well, we've got R and V. These are two variables that are controlling the system. We kept F as a constant. We weren't looking at that as a variable. And we've got XD and XB as two um, outputs. And we got to the point in the lecture where we characterized this using some matrix notation. We said that we could write it like this. Outputs are equal to some function of our inputs. And we said that there were four transfer functions that we could write in here. So the transfer function of, uh, this is how R responds to XD, the transfer function of how V responds to XD, and likewise R to XB, V to XB. And we wrote it out like that. And of course, if you're writing it like this, these terms add up xd is equal to this transfer function times that, this transfer plus this transfer function times v. And, um, and if you believe that, then you could see we had the approach of analyzing this by just changing one of our inputs at a time and then looking at the response of one of our outputs at a time. Uh, to identify what these different transfer functions are. Um, but the question is, why can we do that? Why can we just add them up like that? Um, if you think about a real system, you think, isn't it going to be more complicated than that? Um, why can we use such a simple rule as adding the response to one input to the response to another input? Why does that give the output? Uh, I thought that was an interesting question to think about. And um, uh, so I'm going to look into that uh, a little bit more. Um, so what do you think? Well, the first thing we're going to do is just consider uh, what we're doing with this system uh, in terms of the transfer function notation that we've been using. That's just an example system, but um, Typically, we've just been thinking about a system as its transfer function. So in this case, we want to write it out like that. We've got our inputs R and V, and this uh, input comes in to the system. And then it's going to be subject to two different transfer functions. We've got the one G R X D. And we 
click on the other one. VD. Um, so what we're doing is we're just we're just uh, writing out these equations as they are here, but in terms of the flow within the process as we're modeling it. GV XD. Please get these a bit small. GV XB. So these are the inputs, and then these are the transfer functions that relate these inputs to the different outputs. So if this is our output XD uh, on top, then the transfer function, sorry, the output XD is equal to GR XD which is that one times R, which is that one, plus GVXD, which is that one, multiplied by input V, which is that one. And we're adding them together. So we're saying that these two things will come together through addition. So put a plus next to this little device that adds those two things together. And that's what gives us our output XD. And then likewise, we do the same down here. We add these two together to get our output XB. So we can do this as our block diagram um, to visualize how this process is working. So we can do it as a matrix equation and we can visualize it as our control block diagram. Um, and really the question of why can we just add these together like this? Um, obviously with this system, it's nice and simple and you can imagine how much more complex systems can start to be broken down and represented like that. Well, to make sure we understand it first, uh, I'll just look at the uh, simpler case where we have two transfer functions in series to make sure we understand what's happening with that. So, so we've got an input X, an output Y, and what we've been saying is that we can simply calculate our output y is going to be equal to g1 multiplied by g2 multiplied by x. Uh, it's so simple, but why can we do that? And when's that true? So the starting point of understanding that, well, let's take an intermediate function f. <clears throat> and we can write that f is equal to g1 times x. So, so long as we can write that, then this is true. What does it take to be able to write that equation? Well, it requires us to have linear differential equations. Uh, it's the linear aspect of the differential equation that enables us to break it down into a form where we can write it simply as a product like that. Uh, if your equation isn't linear, then when you do Laplace transforms, it won't be in a form that you can write out like that. Once we've got the expression for f, we can write an expression for y. That's going to be equal to g2 times f. Uh, and obviously substitute in for f. And then we get what we're looking for, g1, g2 times x. So really, this, this property just comes down to the fact um, that uh, for a linear equation, we can use the Laplace transform um, to write it out like this. And as long as we can do that, then when one function is followed by another, we simply multiply their transfer functions together to find out what happens. Okay. Um, there's a question on the uh, chat. Uh, which um, section or which book do you suggest to enhance and which chapter? Um, so um, I'm just thinking about how to show that. Oh, hang on, that's not going to happen. 
Okay, so um, I think I can show you that in a moment. Try again. And, uh, here we go. So this textbook is the main one that we recommend for this course. This is a PDF copy of it that I've got. Uh, Chemical Process Control, an Introduction to Theory and Practice by George Stephanopoulos. And uh, uh, I've, it's really great. Uh, it's the first year I'm teaching control. I studied control as an undergraduate years ago. Um, and when I studied, I actually studied it mainly in the context of electrical engineering um, because I did a general engineering degree. So my, uh, my textbooks about control were a bit more generic than um, this one. This one's lovely because it's all about control in the chemical process context. And uh, it really starts at the beginning and systematically works through the topics one by one um, to explain them clearly. Just uh, seeing if I can make that a bit bigger for you to look at. Okay, so uh, and which section? Well, the sections in here uh, follow quite nicely the uh, sections of our lecture course. Um, the beginning chapters we haven't looked at so much, then we're more about background. Um, but here we go development of a mathematical model. Um, and um, modeling considerations. So all of this is about understanding how to represent the dynamics of a process in equations. So that gives you the fundamentals. Um, chapter six is about linearization. And so that's about, well, you've got your, your dynamic models of the process. Uh, how can you make sure that they're linear? And then chapter seven is the Laplace transforms. So the lectures, the revision lectures that we did on Laplace transforms cover this chapter. And then once you've got the Laplace transforms, then you can go into the business of solving the dynamic equations to find out a system response. So that's what we've been doing in chapter eight. Chapter 10 is focusing on first order systems. Uh, we've talked about those a lot and their characteristics. And then chapter 11 is about second order systems. So we've had a lecture about that. And then chapter 12 is about higher order systems. Um, we discussed that quite briefly. It's quite a short chapter here as well. So it gives you a bit of uh, insight of how to generalize our observations from first and second order systems to um, uh, capture the essential behavior of the higher order systems. Uh, then you can see feedback control, chapter 13. And so that's uh, covering the uh, type of discussion that uh, I did in the mini lectures this week. So you see that this book is nice because the chapters uh, mirror quite closely um, the presentation that we've been doing. Um, and you can read it with uh, not too much background knowledge uh, and everything's explained um, pretty clearly from the beginning. So this book is uh, currently available in the library, uh, but I appreciate that uh, getting into the library is uh, not as straightforward as it used to be. Um, so, See if you can find a copy for yourselves. Uh, it's a great read and will really help you with the course. So that's uh, just answering that chat message. Um, and okay, going back to this, uh, and it really addresses these questions. It uh, it really helps to understand the assumptions and the methods we're using uh, to do this. That's why I'm uh, going over this topic. Okay, so that's the first part we were doing. Why do we, why are we able just to multiply them together? Then we're going to look at the next question of why are we able to add them together really is what the question's about. When we've got the system like this, you know, we know we've got R and V coming in, we know we've got XD and XB coming out. 
why are we able just to say that there's individual transfer functions between the inputs and the outputs and why are we able to say that we're just able to add them together surely that's too simple uh, why are we able to do that and what are the limitations on that so i'm just going to illustrate that with a, an example um, just to show what happens when you work it through so this is uh, an example uh, again so i've got xd um, and xb uh, and it's just some generic equations describing how they could be related So this is uh, uh, an equation. We've not taken the Laplace transform yet. We've got our outputs xd, xb. Uh, we've got our inputs r and v. So these terms a, b, c, and d are just constants as we're treating it here. Uh, and of course, xd, xb, r, and v are all functions of time. And writing it like this, we have a linear first order ordinary differential equation. And we've got a system with some coupled behavior. Like that, so we've got these two equations uh, and you can see that they're coupled because XD and XB are both occurring in both of them. So that's typical of what happens if you write, if you work out what the uh, dynamic equations are for a particular system with multiple inputs and multiple outputs, you're going to find you get coupled equations. Uh, these are simplified and they're just ordinary differential equations. They could be partial differential equations, um, but the approach would uh, stay the same. So how do we tackle this? Um, well, the first thing that we want to do is we know we want to take Laplace transforms of it. Um, and uh, we know that we want to find the deviation variables. When you take the Laplace transform of the derivative term, uh, we know that that's going to have um, a term in it, which is the value of xb at time zero. And so uh, to make life simple, we want to get rid of that. And that gives us a, a more general equation for the response of the system. Uh, so the first thing you do is you um, find the deviation variables such that at time zero, everything's at steady state uh, and of equal to value zero. And that means that we can take this, the Laplace transforms and Laplace transform of xd dash then is just equal to s times xd. Laplace transform of a xd is just a xd. And I'm putting the bar on to indicate that these are the Laplace transforms uh, and so on through the equation. Likewise for the next equation. Okay, something like that. Um, so obviously this isn't a proof for every situation, uh, but it's a fairly generic example and I'm sure you believe me that uh, if it works for this, you could believe there's a proof for it working in general. Uh, and essentially this is about having linear equations. These are linear equations because we have terms of our variables which are just on their own. They're not raised to any power or to the power one uh, and there's no other interaction between them. There's no xd times xb, um, there's no xd times xb dashed. None of that. So that's what makes them linear equations. It gives them these convenient properties. And uh, once we've got this far, well, now we can see we've got two equations, two simultaneous equations, and we've got two unknowns, xd and xb. So we want to solve them. Um, and you can see that we can just rewrite these now and do some substitution uh, to do that. So in this case, if I take equation two, we can write an equation for xb in terms of everything else. like that. And then you can substitute that into equation one. And then we'll get that s plus a 
all of this stuff. It's a bit clunky. Um, excuse me, I have to see someone who's just come to the door. Apologies, I'm back. Uh, so we substituted it in, and uh, that equals this bit here on the right, so that's CR plus DV. And um, so now you can see we've got an equation for XD that pops up in a couple of places, so we can rewrite that to give us XD is equal to S plus E times C minus BG divided by S plus A, S plus E minus BF multiplied by R plus S plus E D minus BH over S plus A, S plus E minus BF times V. Um, and obviously, we could do the same thing to find XB. I won't do that here. Um, but what can you see? Well, this is showing us why we can use this method. We've shown that for a set of typical coupled differential equations, as long as they're linear, we can then do the Laplace transform method and work through to show that the response XD is going to be equal to a linear combination of the two inputs, that's the key thing. That because of linear equations to begin with, we've shown that you end up with a linear uh, output. So it's a combination of R um, plus some linear combination with V. And what we have here are the two transfer functions. So this is the transfer function that relates our output XD to the input v, uh, R. And this is the transfer function that relates the output XD to the input V. Um, and uh, you can see they share the same denominator. So that's a characteristic equation for um, the response to uh, both of the inputs. And they have a different numerator, which will determine their specific behavior. So I hope you can uh, see then that that's why we can do this method. That's what we were looking at. Uh, that's why we can follow this approach and why these block diagrams work um, where you could take your inputs and your outputs and you know that your output is just going to be some linear combination of these inputs. Uh, so you can map it out, you can write the transfer function that relates each input to each output and you can just add them together. And the power of these diagrams will become apparent or started to become apparent in the uh, last uh, mini lectures I did where you can then introduce feedback control so you can have control loops which start to come around um, and influence things. So you can take a measurement of XD. So you've got something that is trying to measure XD. And we put a tilde above that, so it's an estimated measurement of XD. Um, and then we've got something else. Okay, it's a controller, so we want to have XD SP, so that's our set point, that's what we want XD to be. So that's going to go in here, and then we have comparator, which is going to compare these two things. So this signal coming out here is our error, so we've uh, got an error now, and the error is going to do something. And so the controller then is about what can you do with that error to adjust the system if you're not at the set point. Okay, 
So that's the revision of that point. Okay. Um, then the next point I wanted to look at was about linearization. Um, so I emphasized that this is only something that works when you have linear equations. And that's why it's important to be able to recognize is your equation linear or not. So here's an equation that was similar to what we were looking at last time. But is it linear now? Do you think that's a linear equation? And no, it's not because we've got this term here, the XD times XB term. That's a nonlinear term because the uh, two things are being multiplied by each other, the two variables. So it's nonlinear. So of course, many systems or most systems in real life are nonlinear. Um, and uh, coupled with that is that in maths, most of the solution techniques are for linear systems. Uh, it's much harder to solve nonlinear systems than linear ones. So rather than spending all our time trying to find ways to solve nonlinear systems, instead we spend our time linearizing the system and solving it. And you're familiar with linearization. You started doing that in first year. I won't labor the point too much, but you know that if you have some function which is nonlinear, you can approximate it at a point as a linear function. So at some point here, we're gonna say, okay, at that point, we're gonna approximate it as a linear function like that. And obviously that's okay in this vicinity. It's only true at one point, at one point it is correct. Near that point, it is a reasonable estimate of it. And obviously as you get away from it, it becomes a really bad estimate for what's going on. So linearization is great because so you can turn uh, anything that's non-linear into something that's linear. And then we can use all of these powerful techniques to, um, to characterize the process and to work out stability and to come up with control strategies. Um, but obviously they're only true at a particular point. So if you're running your process, if you're running your process and it only ever stays within this particular range, uh, then that's good. You can find your control strategy at this point where you've linearized it, um, and that's fine. But if you're running a process where you want to run it, you want to run it at different conditions at different times. So perhaps this is sort of operation mode two, but this is operation mode, sorry, operation mode one, and this is operation mode two. Then the system dynamics will be quite different at this point than they are at this point. And so you'd have to linearize it again at another point. I come up with a different set of equations and a different set of control strategy um, for that point. So you have to appreciate that when you linearize, it's a, becoming just a specific point uh, where it's behaving. Now for control, that's not a, too bad a thing to do because we are only really interested in how does the system behave around a particular steady state operating point. Uh, and the whole point of your control normally is to return the system to that operating point uh, if there's a disturbance. So it's not too bad a idea uh, or too bad an approximation to say that actually we are going to just stay within quite a narrow band of our chosen operating point. Um, so we want to check that we know how to linearize. Um, obviously you've done this uh, in first year um, using the Taylor series. Um, so how do we do that? Just to make sure we can implement it. So we're talking about the Taylor series. Uh, or McLaren series, if uh, you're doing this about point to, at time zero. Uh, so our function here is x d x b. That's the particular function that's nonlinear. So that's what we want to linearize. So it's equal to the value of x d x b at our steady state point. And we differentiate it with respect to each of the variables. 
Uh, there are two things in it, so we have to differentiate it by each of them. So that's differentiating by xd, and that's at our steady state point, multiplied by xd minus xd steady state, plus the other term, when we differentiate by xb, like that. And so these two terms are being calculated at a specific point. So these just become a number. And then our system is linearized because we just have an xd there and an xb there. And obviously there are the other terms, the higher order terms, which we're neglecting. So it's just a, a simple um, approximation, which gives us the linear result. And uh, often you'll find then that uh, we can simplify even further um, when we bring this into the deviation variable analysis, <clears throat> um, because then the steady state term here uh, would be zero. So it was a deviation variable. You'll find that um, this then cancels out with something else. Uh, to become the deviation variable. Uh, and in this case, we're considering uh, the process <clears throat> where our the point at which we're taking the approximation is the steady state operation. So at steady state operation, xd and xb are going to be constant. Um, and so if you calculate what these terms are, <clears throat> you differentiate xd, xb by xd, <clears throat> obviously you are getting xb at uh, the steady state value, and likewise here, <clears throat> you differentiate xd, xb by xb, you get xd coming out at its steady state value. Uh, so using the deviation variables, these will then, in this case, will be equal to zero. Um, so in this case, with this function, uh, with deviation variables, the linear approximation at the steady state point is simply that it's uh, equal to zero. Um, but obviously that's not always the case. And uh, this method will equip you to linearize uh, all sorts of different things. Okay, so those are the points that I wanted to cover today. Uh, do you have any questions? If you do, you can uh, put them in the chat box now. I can't see any coming. So we're going to uh, finish this session and then please do join the teaching assistants and uh, we will, uh, they can uh, talk you through some examples of this um, to make sure that you understand linear and nonlinear equations uh, and another example of how to do a linearization. Um, and uh, also they can help you with questions, any questions from the previous week's questions, um, problem sheets to make sure that you're up to date, ready for uh, when you delve into control next week. Okay, so thank you very much. And Professor Costas, we'll see you next week. And I will see you again at the end of the module. I'm gonna teach the final week uh, material. So I'll see you at the end uh, and then we'll probably do some revision sessions and so on as well. Thank you very much.